Later in the program, CCC's Executive Director Jennifer March will tell us about work to raise the age of criminal responsibility in New York. She believes it's quite clear that these reforms are in the best interest of New York's children, youth, and the communities, and community safety. Our keynote speaker this morning, we're in for a huge treat. His name is Brian Stevenson. He's been at the forefront of efforts here in New York and across the country. He told me this morning that he has 200 death penalty cases going. He's working for reform in both the juvenile and the adult criminal justice systems. He's been referred to as a young American Nelson Mandela, a freedom fighter, if you will. He's a crusader for justice, and Brian is a steadfast champion for the poor, the incarcerated, and the condemned through his legal work and with Equal Justice Initiative. It provides legal representation to defendants and prisoners who've been denied fair treatment within the legal system. In his best-selling novel, Just Mercy, Brian describes his childhood growing up in a poor and racially segregated town in Delaware and how he rose to become a lawyer who represents those who have been abandoned by the legal system. His clients include mentally disabled people whose crimes are directly re related to having unmet special needs, people on death row, as I mentioned, 200 of them, and children who've been prosecuted as adults and put in adult prisons where they often face physical and sexual abuse. He's recently been named to the Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, and once you hear from him, you'll know why. Brian Stevenson is one of the most visibly astute legal minds in the country, and it is a great privilege to have him here. Brian. Thank you so much and good morning. I am so thrilled to be here. It's a great, great privilege to be uh, in this room celebrating the incredible work of this organization. Uh, we really can't understand the challenges of children and talk about the challenges that we face in this state and across this country unless we put in context the way this country has changed over the last 40 years. America is a very different place today than it was 40 years ago. And the difference is a really tragic one. In 1972, we had 300,000 people in jails and prisons. Today, we have 2.3 million. The United States now has the highest rate of incarceration in the world. We have 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's in prison. There's 6 million people on probation or parole. There are 70 million Americans with criminal arrests which means that when they try to get a loan or try to get a job or try to uh, get housing, they are disadvantaged by that arrest history. The percentage of women going to prison has increased 640%. 70% of the women who go to jails and prisons are single parents with minor children. You're much more likely to end up in jail and prison if you are the child of an incarcerated parent. The statistic that really bothers me is that the Bureau of Justice now predicts that one in three black male babies born in this country is expected to go to jail or prison. One in three. That was not true in the 20th century. That was not true in the 19th century. That became true in the 21st century. The statistic for Latino boys is one in six. This year was the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March. The president came, members of Congress came, 80,000 people came to Selma to celebrate the 50th anniversary. Almost none of them knew that in the state of Alabama today, 31% of the black male population has permanently lost the right to vote. The level of disenfranchisement in this country is at a record high since the passage of the Voting Rights Act. And the challenge is not just these data, not just these problems, it is our collective indifference to this phenomenon. And so I want to talk to you this morning about what I think we need to do to change things. I am persuaded that we really need to change America. I really believe that. We really need to create more justice. We have to create more hope. We have to create more opportunity. I spend my time in poor neighborhoods and in poor communities, I sometimes sit down with 12 and 13 year old kids in low income housing centers and projects. And when I have honest conversation with these children, what they will tell me is, many of them, that they don't expect to be free by the time they're 21. There is an expectation of incarceration. 
And they don't say that because of something that they've seen on TV. They don't say that because of something they've heard. They say that because that's what they see happening in their communities. And this absence of hope, I believe, is a crisis. I don't know how we've gotten to a point in this country where we can actually know that the Bureau of Justice predicts that one in three black kids is going to jail or prison, and we do nothing. And so I want to talk about four things. And I'm so, so thrilled that many of you come out on an early morning to be in a space like this. But I want to talk about four things I think we all have to do to change the world. The first is I am persuaded that if we want to make a difference for the children of this city, the children of this state, we first have to commit ourselves to getting proximate to the places and the people who are at risk. You cannot change the world from a distance. If you want to make a difference in the world, you've got to get close to the children and the communities and the places where there is suffering, where there's inequality, where there's abuse of power. I am persuaded that we have too many decision makers and policy makers trying to change things, trying to improve things from a distance. And when you're standing at a distance, you miss the nuances and details of problems. It's only when you get close that you hear and see those details. Proximity is important because you'll learn things that you can't learn from a distance. You'll not only learn things, but you'll also learn that you have more power than you think you have. I'm a product of proximity. I grew up in a community where black children could not go to the public schools. I started my education in a colored school. In my community, when my dad was a teenager, there were no high schools for black children. And I remember when I was a little boy, the lawyers coming into our community to make them open up the public schools. And but for the intervention of these lawyers, but for their choice to get proximate, I wouldn't be standing here this morning. But because they did, I got to go to high school. And then I got to go to college. I had a great time in college. I went to college in Pennsylvania. I uh, was very active in music. I was very active in sports. Uh, I was a philosophy major. Um, I actually loved college. I, didn't, I just thought it was great that you could go someplace and you go to the dining hall and they feed you and then you go outside and you play with your friends. And, and I just decided after my third year in college that I wanted to stay in college the rest of my life. <laughs> And I was a philosophy major, so I would sometimes say to my friends, I'd say, oh, you know, I'm, I'm a philosophy major, so I'm going to go out on the hillside and I'm going to think some deep thoughts. And I would. I'd go out there and I'd, I'd sit there. And one day during my senior year, I was out there on the hillside and somebody came up to me and said, well, you're a, you're a philosophy major and you're a senior. What are you going to do after you graduate? And I heard this as a very hostile question uh, because I realized that nobody was going to pay me to philosophize when I graduated. And so I started to figure out how I could stay in school. And because nobody in my family had graduated from college, I didn't know what I'm sure all of you know. I didn't know that in this country, if you want to do graduate work in history or English or political science, you actually have to know something about history, English, or political science to get admitted. And so I kept, I was intimidated by that, so I kept looking around. And to be honest, that's how I found law school. Uh, <laughs> It was pretty clear to me that you don't need to know anything to go to law school. <laughs> and so uh, <laughs> I signed up for that. And a few months later, I found myself sitting in a classroom at Harvard Law School. And I was so disappointed because I went to law school because I was interested in doing something about racial inequality. I wanted to do something about poverty. I wanted to do something about injustice. And it didn't sound like anybody was talking about race or poverty, or injustice. So I decided to leave. I finished my first year, and then I went to the School of Government at Harvard, uh, the Kennedy School, and I thought that'll be a better program for me. And I went over to the School of Government, and two months into my year there, I woke up one morning and I looked in the mirror and I thought to myself, wow, I'm even more miserable here than I was at the law school. <laughs> so I went back to the law school, and in the midst of my law school career, I took a course that required that I get proximate to people on death row. And I found this community of people in this country who were literally dying for legal assistance. Hundreds of them facing execution. We have an horrific system. This country, we have a system of justice that treats you better if you're rich and guilty than if you're poor and innocent. Wealth, not culpability, shapes outcomes. And I couldn't believe how we were actually killing people with no access to lawyers, with no access to fairness. It's then that I began to practice in this area and started to learn something about children. You know, proximity is important. My clients have gotten younger and younger and younger, and the things that we have to understand is that there are ways in which these problems have emerged because of some of the things that we've let happen. You know, 30 years ago, we had people going around this country arguing that some children aren't children. 
And these criminologists try to persuade us that there are kids that look like kids, that sometimes sound like kids, that sometimes act like kids, but they're not really kids. And these criminologists argue that these children, mostly black and brown kids, they said, are not children. They said they're super predators. That's the word they made up. And they used that word to demonize a generation of children. And that's when states like New York started lowering the minimum age for trying children as adults. It's when the state started putting kids in adult systems. We now have 15 states with no minimum age for trying a child as an adult. There are some 3,000 children who've been sentenced to die in prison. 10,000 children on any given day are in adult jails or prisons with no sight or sound separation. And proximity to this, I will tell you, will make you want to do different things. I worked on a case some years ago involving a 14-year-old boy who was living in a household where his mother was repeatedly the target of a lot of domestic violence. She had a boyfriend, and when this man would start drinking, he would get violent. And one day, the man had been drinking, and he came home, and he walked into the kitchen, and he called the boy's mother into the kitchen, and she walked in there, and the man just walked up to her, and he just punched her in the face. She fell down, and she hit her head as she fell down, and she was on the floor, unconscious, bleeding. Her son came running into the kitchen to help his mom recover, and he tried to wake up his mom. He tried to get her to, 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 to respond, but she was non-responsive. And after 10 minutes, this child thought his mom was dead. She wasn't dead, but he thought she was. This little boy got up, and he walked into the bedroom where the man was sleeping. And he started to go to the phone to call the police or the ambulance, but instead he walked over to a dresser drawer where he knew this man kept his handgun. He opened the drawer and he pulled out the gun and this little boy walked over to where the man was sleeping and he pointed the gun at the man's head. The man was snoring and when the man stopped snoring, this little boy tragically pulled the trigger and shot this man in the head. The man died almost instantly. This little boy was very small for his age. He was under five feet tall. He weighed less than 100 pounds. He'd never been in trouble before. Uh, had no prior juvenile adjudications. He was actually a decent student and he might have been tried as a juvenile, but for the fact that the man that he shot and killed, his mother's boyfriend, that man was a deputy sheriff. And because he was a deputy sheriff, the prosecutor insisted that this child be tried as an adult. The judge certified him to stand trial as an adult, and they immediately placed him in an adult jail. He'd been there three days before his grandmother called me to get involved and asked me if I would get involved. I said I would. I went to the jail. And this little boy walked into the visitation room, and he was so small, and he seemed so terrified. He sat down, I started asking him questions, but no matter what I asked him, he wouldn't say a word. I finally put my pen down, I said, look, I can't help you if you don't talk to me, you got to talk to me. He just kept staring at the wall. Couldn't figure out what to do, so I got up and I walked around the table, I pulled my chair close to him, I said, come on, you got to talk to me, I can't help you if you don't talk to me. And a little boy just kept staring at the wall. Couldn't figure out what to do. So after a few minutes, I just leaned on him. I don't even know why, but I leaned on him. And when I leaned on him, he leaned back. And when he leaned back, I put my arm around him and I said, come on, you got to talk to me. I can't help you if you don't talk to me. And that's when this little boy started crying hysterically. And through his tears, he began talking to me not about what happened with the man, not about what happened with his mother. He started talking to me about what had happened at the jail. He told me on the first night several men had heard him. He told me on the next night he'd been raped by several people. He told me on the night before I'd gotten there, so many people had hurt him. He couldn't remember how many there had been. I held this little boy while he cried hysterically for almost an hour. I finally got him calm. I said, you stay right here. I'm going to get you out of here. And I tried to leave. I will never forget that child grabbing my arm and saying, please, please, please don't go. I said, no, it's okay, it's all right, I'm going to be right back, you just stay right here. I left that jail, and the question I had in my mind is, who is responsible for this? And the answer is, we are. We are. We have been too silent in this country. We have been indifferent. We have been too distant from the children in our country that are most at need. Whenever a country begins to believe that some of its children aren't really children, we are going to do cruel things. We're going to do abusive things. We're going to do unjustice things, unjust things. I believe all children are children. And when we forget that, we are at risk. And so we have to get closer to these children. You've been taught that if there are parts of the city where there's high crime or where there are bad schools or where there's abuse or neglect or suffering and inequality, what we've been taught is you stay away from those parts of the community. I'm here to argue that you should get closer to those parts of our community. You should get closer to the people who are being incarcerated. You should get closer to the people who are coming out of jails and prisons because proximity will teach you how to change the world.
Second thing, I believe that we can't just get proximate. We have to change the narrative behind the problems that have given rise to the way we're dealing with children in New York. You see, there is a narrative behind mass incarceration. It's not just that we've made bad policy choices. We decided to deal with drug addiction as a crime issue rather than a health issue. We decided to kind of take away power and discretion from professionals in the court system, and we created mandatory sentencing. All of those are parts of the problem, but the real problem is that we've been corrupted by a narrative of fear and anger. We've allowed our politicians to compete with one another over who can be the toughest on crime, and any time you make policy decisions rooted in fear and anger, you will be abusive. You will create injustice. You will create inequality. I look around the world, wherever there's oppression, wherever there's abuse of power, wherever people are being mistreated, there is a narrative of fear and anger behind those policies. And so we have to change the narrative. We have to resist the politics of fear and anger. I think we have to change the narrative in this country about race. You see, I think all of us are infected with a disease. We are all burdened by our history of racial inequality in this country. Our parents and grandparents could have and should have done something, but they didn't. As a result of that, we are bearing the burden of this narrative of racial difference. So I think we actually have to commit ourselves to truth and reconciliation. I think we have to talk about things we have not talked about. You see, I think we have to talk about the genocide in America, what we did to indigenous people and the ways in which we actually allowed this narrative to manifest itself. You see, I think we have to talk about things like slavery. We've never had the conversation in this country that we need to have about slavery and the way it shaped us and created this legacy. I don't think the great evil of American slavery was involuntary servitude and forced labor. For me, the great evil of American slavery was the narrative of racial difference we created to legitimate it. It was the ideology of white supremacy that we made up so we would feel better about owning other human beings. There were slavery all over the world, slavery in Africa, slavery in Asia. Those were mostly societies with slavery. Anybody could fall into slavery. It was transitional. In America, we became a slave society. We made slavery a permanent hereditary status centrally tied toward race. And to legitimate it, we made up this idea of white supremacy. And we never dealt with it. The 13th Amendment doesn't deal with the narrative of racial difference. It only deals with involuntary servitude. And it's why I've argued that slavery didn't really end in 1865. It just evolved. It turned into decades of terrorism and violence and lynching. Between 1870 and 1945, we lynched thousands of people. We traumatized people of color, and we reinforced this narrative of racial difference. Older people of color come up to me sometimes, and they say, Mr. Stevenson, I get so angry when I hear somebody on TV talking about how we're dealing with terrorism for the first time in our nation's history after 9-11. They say, we grew up with terror. We had to worry about being bombed and lynched every day of our lives. The demographic geography of this country, this city, this state, was shaped by terror. Most of the black people that are in New York City, in Buffalo, in Detroit, in Cleveland, in Chicago, in Boston, in Los Angeles, in Oakland, did not come to these communities as immigrants looking for new economic opportunities. They came to these communities as refugees and exiles from terror in the South. Beginning of the 20th century, 90-some percent of the black population lived in the Deep South. They fled during the 20th century from terror, traumatized. If you know anything about refugee communities, you know you have to deal with that trauma. We haven't done that. Even when we talk about civil rights, I get worried, I'll be honest. It's the 50th anniversary of a lot of things, but I hear people talking about the civil rights movement, and we're so celebratory, and everybody gets to celebrate. We don't ask any qualifying questions, and it worries me. I hear people talking about the civil rights movement, and it sounds like a three-day carnival. On day one, Rosa Parks didn't give up her seat on a bus. On day two, Dr. King led a march on Washington. And on day three, we just changed all the laws. And I mean, if that was our history, we'd be a great country, but that's not our history. Our history is that for decades, we have humiliated people of color. For decades, we burdened and battered and excluded and beat. We told black people, you're not good enough to vote. We told them you're not good enough to go to school with the rest of us. We have marginalized and isolated and not valued the victimization and suffering of communities of color. And because of that, we are struggling. And the children that are most at risk are these kids of color. And we won't get to it until we change the narrative about race. I think we should have committed ourselves to a process of truth and reconciliation at the end of the civil rights movement, but we didn't do it. And so we have to do it now. We actually have to begin to talk about these issues. We have a project. We want to create spaces in this country where we resurrect the history of our nation. 
If you go to South Africa, there's a recognition that they couldn't survive apartheid without truth and reconciliation. If you go to Rwanda, there's a recognition that they will not recover from the genocide without truth and reconciliation. Go to Germany. If you go to Germany and Berlin, you can't go 100 meters without seeing a small stone or a marker that's been placed at the home of a Jewish family that was abducted and taken to the camps. The Germans want you to go to the camps and reflect soberly on the history of the Holocaust. In this country, we do the opposite. We don't like talking about race. We don't like talking about racial justice. We ignore this, these disparities, and we have to change that narrative. Third thing, it's not enough just to get proximate and change the narrative. I believe that we will not raise the age in this state. We will not create better outcomes from children until we become more hopeful about what we can do. You see, I believe that hopelessness is the enemy of justice. It is the big burden that most of our children face. We are too hopeless about what we can do to help our children. I go into courtrooms and I see a hopeless judge and a hopeless prosecutor and a hopeless defense attorney, and I know there won't be justice. I go into too many schools where I see hopeless principals and teachers and kids, and I know there won't be the kind of intervention we need. Your hope is necessary. You have to believe things we have not seen in this country, in this city, about what we can do for all of our children. And if you're not hopeful, you're not going to be able to help. So you've got to protect your hope. I don't know what makes you hopeless. I know what makes me hopeless. And I've got to protect myself from the things that make me hopeless, just like you have to protect yourself from the things that make you hopeless. And I'll be honest, I'll tell you what makes me hopeless. I live in Alabama. It's the worst state in the country for me to be living in. Because what makes me hopeless is when I hear people trying to romanticize. They start talking about the good old days. And I don't like it when people try to play off our history. I don't like the Confederate flag. I don't like these images of the old South. I don't like the way we have tried to hide from these realities. And being hopeless will get you into a lot of trouble. We have to believe things we have not seen. Hope is what will get you to stand up when other people are saying, sit down. Hope is what will get you to speak when other people are saying, be quiet. I had the great privilege as a young lawyer of knowing Rosa Parks. She was an amazing person. And what she taught me was the importance of hope. When I was a young lawyer, I moved to Montgomery, and Johnny Carr, the architect of the Montgomery Bus Boycott, called me up, and she said, Brian, I understand you're a young lawyer. Just moved to town. I said, yes, I am. She said, well, I'm Johnny Carr. I'm the architect of the Montgomery Bus Boycott. I'm the president of the Montgomery Improvement Association. And she said, since you're a young lawyer, uh, I'm going to call you up sometimes, and I'm going to ask you to go some places and speak. And then she said, sometimes I'm going to ask you to go some places and listen. And she said, when I call you up and ask you to do something, you're going to say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> so I said, yes, ma'am. And she would call me up and send me places and to, to talk and sometimes send me places to listen. And then one day she called me up and she said, Brian, Miss Parks is coming to down. Rosa Parks is coming back from Detroit. And we're going to go over to Virginia Durr's house, this white woman whose husband Clifford Durr represented Dr. King. We're just going to talk. She said, do you want to come over and listen? I said, oh, yes, ma'am, I do. And then she, sometimes she would say, well, now, Brian, what does the word listen mean? And I'd have to explain to her that I knew I wasn't supposed to talk, but I went over there and I listened to these women talk. And what was amazing to me, in their 70s and 80s, they weren't talking about what they had done. They were talking about their hopes of what they were going to do. And hopefulness is important. I sat there and listened for two hours. I was so inspired. And after two hours, Ms. Parks turned to me and she says, now, Brian, uh, tell me what you're trying to do. Tell me what the Equal Justice Initiative is. Tell me about your work. And I looked at Ms. Carr to see if I had permission to speak, and she nodded. And I gave her my rap. I said, we're trying to do something to end the death penalty. We want to eliminate these abusive conditions of confinement. We're trying to help children prosecuted as adults. We're trying to do something about mental illness in the jails and prisons. We want to talk about race. We want to do something about poverty. We want to do something about abuse and neglect. We want to do something about the way in which we're creating mass incarceration. I gave her my whole rap. And when I finished, she looked at me and she said, mm, mm, mm. She said, that's going to make you tired, tired, tired. And that's when Ms. Carr leaned forward and she put her finger in my face and she said, that's why you've got to be brave, brave, brave. We have to be courageous to be hopeful. But your hope is essential. Now, I wish I could stop right here. Proximity, change the narrative and hope, but I've got one more. I don't think we can create a new world. We can't create a better future for our children just by getting proximate, just by changing narratives and just by being hopeful. The fourth thing we have to do is that we have to do uncomfortable things. I hate saying that, because doing uncomfortable things is hard. Human beings are built to do what's comfortable. But I'm here to tell you that we have never ended injustice and oppression. We have never created real opportunity. We've never done things that transform society by just doing the things that are comfortable. To change the world, you've got to do uncomfortable things. I've read and studied. I've never seen it happen without someone doing something uncomfortable. 
You know, it's hard because we're all programmed to seek comfort. We like comfort. I like comfort. I'm not speaking against comfort. I gave a talk down in Mississippi, and I flew down there, and the people met me at the airport. They said, oh, Mr. Stevenson, we know all about you. We know what kind of person you are. We know what kind of lawyer you are. We know what kind of work you do. And we're having our conference at the luxurious Double Tree Hotel. And we decided that you wouldn't want to stay at the luxurious Double Tree Hotel. So we've asked one of the farmers to put you up at the barn. I said, what is wrong with you? I said, of course I want to stay at the luxurious Double Tree Hotel. I like those cookies just like everybody else. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is that you have to position yourselves in difficult places. You have to say things that people sometimes don't want to hear. You have to fight against things that you don't have to fight about, but they're necessary. And there's a different metric system for those of us who want to do this. It was taught to me by an older man. I was giving a talk in a church, and an older man came into the back of the church. He was sitting in the back just staring at me. He had this very stern, almost angry look on his face. And I was distracted by him because he was looking at me so intensely. And I got through my talk, and people came up to me, and they were very nice, but that man kept sitting in the back staring at me. And finally, when everybody else left, he got a little boy, this older black man in this wheelchair, got a little boy to wheel him up to the front of the church. And he came down the middle aisle of that church with this stern, angry look on his face. And he got in front of me, and he put his hand up, and he said, do you know what you're doing? And I just stood there. And he asked me again, he said, do you know what you're doing? And I stepped back, and I mumbled something. Then he asked me one last time, he said, do you know what you're doing? And then he looked at me and he says, I'm going to tell you what you're doing. And this older man looked at me and he says, you're beating the drum for justice. You keep beating the drum for justice. And I was so moved. I was also really relieved because I just didn't know. (laughs) Then, But then he grabbed me by my jacket and he pulled me into his wheelchair. He said, come here, come here, come here. He said, I'm going to show you something. And this older man turned his head and he said, you see this scar I have behind my right ear? He says, I got that scar in Greene County, Alabama, 1963, trying to register people to vote. Then he turned his head and he said, you see this cut I have down here at the bottom of my neck? He said, I got that cut in Philadelphia, Mississippi, 1964, trying to register people to vote. He turned his head and he said, you see this dark spot on my head? He said, that's my bruise. Got my bruise in Birmingham, Alabama, 1965, trying to register people to vote. And then he looked at me, he says, I'm going to tell you something, young man. He said, people look at me, they think I'm some old man sitting in a wheelchair covered with cuts and bruises and scars. He said, but I'm going to tell you something. He said, these aren't my cuts. These aren't my bruises. These aren't my scars. He said, these are my medals of honor. There is something that happens when we get proximate, when we change narratives, when we stay hopeful, and when we do uncomfortable things. I believe really simple things. I believe that each of us is more than the worst thing we've ever done. I think if somebody tells a lie, they're not just a liar. I think if somebody takes something that doesn't belong to them, they're not just a thief. I think even if you kill somebody, you're not just a killer. And there is no community among us for whom that is true more than our children. I am persuaded that in this city and in this state, the opposite of justice, the opposite of poverty is not wealth. We talk too much about money in New York. We talk too much about money in America. I am persuaded that in New York City, And in communities all across the state, the opposite of poverty is not wealth. I believe the opposite of poverty is justice. And when we do justice for our children, we change this narrative and we create a new future. And finally, I believe that when I come to New York, I teach at NYU, I come up here once a week. When I come to this city, I love New York. I love what I see here. It's a beautiful, beautiful city, a beautiful state. But I cannot judge how we're doing in this city. I can't judge how we're doing in this state by looking at how we treat the rich and the powerful and the privileged. You judge the character of a community, its commitment to justice, its commitment to the rule of law, not by looking at how it treats the rich and the powerful and the privileged. To to judge a community, you have to look at how it treats the poor, the incarcerated, and the condemned. We have... We have great challenges in New York. We do. But we also have a great opportunity to get proximate, to change some narratives, to do some hopeful things, and yes, to do some uncomfortable things. And I think when you do that, with wonderful organizations like CCC, we can create a better, more hopeful, healthier future for our children. I'm excited that so many of you are dedicated to that, that you'd come out early in the morning to hear someone like me. I want to wish you all the very, very best. Thank you.
Thank you. The fact that you're on your feet says it all. Brian, thank you so much for banging that drum for justice so loudly. I know that the idea that children are children is something that is reverberating in my head this morning and will throughout the day.